morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this webinar that's being sponsored by the AWT Young Professionals Task Force. I'm Heidi Zimmerman, the Executive Director at AWT, and just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Um, when you signed in, you're in listen-only mode, but we do encourage your participation. So as you have questions, just go ahead and type it into your screen, and we'll take those at the end. So with that, let me introduce our speakers today. Um, Katie Long and Kevin Cope are with Brentag North America. Katie Long has been with Brentag Canada for going on three years, where her previous chloralkali experience, coupled with project management experience, lends itself very well to her current position. In her role at Brentag Canada, Katie has also been tasked with industry development and management, and Katie is the principal architect of Brentag's presence in the industrial water space in Canada. Kevin Cope has spent his career focusing on wastewater treatment, um, and oil processing. Kevin is Brentag North America's water additives business development application specialist focused on customers' technical and application needs. And Kevin is an active member of the AWT Wastewater Committee, a trainer for the AWT Wastewater Seminar, and is currently the AWT supplier representative on the board. So with that, let me turn the program over to Katie and Kevin. Well, thank you, Heidi. We very much appreciate uh, everybody attending today's webinar, and we look forward to presenting uh, the webinar on foam control today to you. Um, Katie and I will be doing slides uh, each individually and back and forth. So with that, um, um, would you like to say anything? But uh, Well, let's start out with the, the agenda and what we're going to talk about today. We're going to the, the, the agenda for today are, is foam creation, the types of foam we see in our industry, how to control foam, the testing required, field applications, markets, and at the end we'll get into any questions you may have uh, about the, our presentation or uh, uh, controlling a foam. Good morning everybody. Thanks for taking time this morning to tune in to the webinar. Uh, to start, we're just going to talk a little bit about what foam actually is. Um, for me personally, it helps to build a mental picture of what I'm talking about and if you haven't already figured it out this morning by my accent, I happen to be the token Canadian on the Brentag Water Additives team. So the most logical and, of course, stereotypical example of foam for me is going to be a freshly poured pint of beer. It is, simply put, a dispersion of a gas, usually air, in a liquid, often water or a solid. So there are several foam control applications, um, particular to water treatment. The major applications are cooling water, wastewater, process water, municipal, and then lastly, internal boiler treatment. Uh, there are also multiple specialty applications, such as paints and coating, textile, fiberglass, and then others. But for the sake of today's discussion, we're going to focus on the top four as they apply to water treatment. So why should we control foam? What is the reason that uh, foam causes problems in our industry? Well, foam can be an aesthetic problem to neighbors and surrounding accounts. Nobody really wants to see foam in their backyard or on their streets. Um, unwanted foam and clarifiers can actually cause solids to float out of clarifier systems, causing you to meet discharge limits on suspended solids. Um, I believe in the state of Pennsylvania, and in Pennsylvania, a discharge of foam, an illegal discharge of foam, can range in about a $25,000 fine. And on your second discharge of foam, you're about $50,000. So there can be um, fines for actually discharging foam. On the operational side, we have problems with slippery floors or unsanitary conditions, say in a food industry. Um, drifting foam, once it lands on cars or on, uh, on different objects, can cause problems with needing to have the cars repainted. Believe it or not, I actually have first-hand experience with that many, many years ago. Um, you can have pump cavitation. And then lastly, you know, foam can cause problems with uh, poor surface, uh, say in the case of plating or in the case of painting, unwanted foam getting on a surface can cause problems. So when we talk about what causes foams, it's important to remember that pure liquids do not foam. Uh, you must have a liquid and a gas source to have foam. Also, you must have some type of agitation. And then there are two types of foam. Uh, they're either biological in nature or created by surfactants. <clears throat> 
so we're going to talk a little bit now about surfactants. And put simply, a surfactant is a molecule that has a water-loving head and a water-hating tail. This causes them basically to orientate themselves on the surface of a bubble. This creates a film that stabilizes the bubble from bursting. The drawing below is basically just a reminder that the water-hating tail is out of the liquid in the air and the water-loving head is immersed in the liquid. Some examples of surfactants are all soaps of fatty acids, all non-ionic ethoxylates, phosphated ethoxylates, and quats. So if we look at what the actual surfactant does, it really is what creates the bubble. As, the, as Katie had mentioned, you have the water-loving and the water-hating end. And then when the air is in the water, these surfactants start to align themselves to actually create a bubble so that when it rises to the top, a bubble is formed. And just if you think about this, if you have no surfactants and you add air to water, the air will simply come to the surface and break and cause no bubbles to be formed. However, if there are surfactants present, as they start to stabilize the bubble, once that air then starts to rise in the top, you get foam creation. So that's basically just a big pictorial of what's happening when you start to have foam starting to be created in a system. So basically, surfactant foam develops when surface active ingredients are introduced into water. An everyday example of this is the foam that's created when you run a bubble bath or Another one is if you've ever shaken up a bottle of a glass cleaner like Windex. The foam created is a surfactant foam, and this type of foam typically is white and then also irregular in shape. Another type of foam that you'll often encounter, particularly in, muni in municipal settings, is biological foam. This foam is created when microorganisms metabolize and break down organics. The foam typically tends to be dry looking in a tan or brown color. In a biological system, a little foam is actually quite typical. However, at times it can get out of control. Dosing the foamer will alleviate the foam. However, in this application, excessive foam is often an indication of an underlying problem such as sludge age. So there are basically four main categories of foam. Of foam. The first one is in trained air. So, um, again, taking it back to my stereotypical example, um, when you think about a pint of freshly poured Guinness, it's another great example of in trained air. Uh, so, really, the foam is often pronounced and it's also actually in the liquid. Uh, micro foam is just very simply put, tiny bubbles. And then impinged air is a type of foam that's created when solids attach themselves to the bubbles. So sometimes in water treatment, we actually use impinged air to our advantage. So when you're using a DAF system, a dissolved air flotation unit, um, the solids actually attach themselves to the bubble, and then we use that to float them to the top, typically. The last type of foam that we're going to talk about is dry foam, and this tends to be the most difficult to address because there's not a lot of water to disperse the foam. Um, we've already commented that this is often found in biological systems. Okay, so the history of foam obviously will fall on my shoulders because I've been around a little longer. Um, the, really, the first defoamers and anti-foams that we saw in the market were things like kerosene's, light oils. Um, I actually remember my early days in the steel industry and the refineries actually pouring kerosene into sumps to knock foam down. The kerosene quickly would come to the top and, you know, work as a defoamer and knocking foam down. Um, 1950s is really when they started doing some experiments with silicones and the use of those products for defoamers. In 1963, the first hydrophobic particles were introduced into the market. And then in the early 70s, you know, the hydrophobic waxes and oil-based products started, in oil-based, started to become very, very prevalent. Well, then in 1973, the oil crisis occurred, and the price of oil went you know, skyrocketed. So the use of oil base and uses of kerosene and light oils became really cost prohibitive to be used in the market. So in the late 70s is when we started to see the water-based defoamers start to be introduced. And those really are really prevalent now in the water treatment industry. 
And in the 1990s, uh, the, the silicone emulsions started to become introduced. Now this is really a key point, the key discussion in what we're talking about. And it's understanding the difference between a defoamer and an antifoam. Well, simply put, a defoamer is a product that removes foam once it occurs. It'll kill the foam or eliminate or remove the foam. An antifoam is a product that prevents foam from occurring. Again, you put it in and no foam will, will appear in your system. It's really key to understand, though, that for the most part, the chemistry of these products are exactly the same. It's just how the product is used and the functionality of the product. Oftentimes, these terms are very, very interchangeable. And in fact, you'll hear today, Katie and I will refer to it as defoam or antifoam, just back and forwards. But it's understanding the functionality of the product. So this slide is really actually one of my favorite slides that I've actually used a number of times over my career. This is actually the photograph of the discharge, sewage discharge at my local municipality. And many years ago, I actually had the defoamer application at this facility. And what would happen is periodically, you get a little bit of foam in the creek or creek. Katie and I have been joking around about that word since we put this together. But a little bit of foam in the creek, and it'll be maybe a foot wide and maybe 10 feet long. And Someone will drive by and they'll see it or one of the neighbors will be upset and they'll call the municipality. And the head of the municipality will instruct the sewage treatment plant, uh, yeah, you got to do something. And the guy will walk out to the little shed there and push a button and the defoamer uh, pump will come on and pump a defoamer into the stream and the, and the foam will go away. And the, the defoamer may be timed for about a two to three hour turn and once that's over it'll shut off. and the foam may or may not come back, or it, it does, it's no big deal because the citizen has already driven down the road. So that product is being fed as a defoamer and is only fed when the, the residents in the area complain. However, for two weeks every year, they would turn the defoamer on and they would run the defoamer pump 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and that product now is functioning as an antifoam. And you're all probably wondering, why two weeks a year would they turn it on and run it 24-7? Well, in western Pennsylvania, two weeks a year, we have the opening of trout season. And so they're feeding the exact same product now as an antifoam to prevent any foam from occurring in the creek while there are cells, or excuse me, while there are, there are fishermen out in the creek fishing. So it's the exact same product in one case used as a defoamer to knock foam down that is there in the creek or fed as an antifoam to keep foam from occurring during the time the trout season is occurring. So I think it paints a pretty mental picture, a pretty nice mental picture on explaining the difference between a defoamer and an antifoam. The same product but used in two different two different ways. When you discuss defoamers or antifoams, there are two key terms that are often used to determine the required outcome and then also to help characterize defoamers. And those two terms are knockdown and or persistency. First, we're going to talk about knockdown. And knockdown is basically defined as the ability for a defoamer to reduce or eliminate foam. Knockdown is typically measured in terms of speed. So how quickly does the foam dissipate and also the thoroughness? Um, does the defoamer reduce the foam or does it eliminate it entirely? So here you can see the defoamer <laughs> works really well. Um, depending on the application, you may not actually need to kill the foam entirely, just reduce it. So an example of this is if you're controlling foam in a tank, you likely just need to prevent that from overflow. Moving to persistency, persistency refers to a defoamer's ability to keep foam from reoccurring. We measure, again, this in terms of time. How long does the defoamer keep the foam down? Um, also, does some of the foam or all of it reoccur? Again, talking about that example of the tank, uh, do you need to just prevent the tank from overflowing and therefore is it fine if some of the foam does reoccur? Some of the characteristics of defoamers are <clears throat> insolubility of the antifoamer defoamer. It has to be out of the liquid in order for it to be effective. Uh, low surface tension, so this addresses dispersing properties. <clears throat> 
needs to be surface active because this is where the foam occurs. And then lastly, the ability for it to penetrate into the bubble wall. So here is a great visual aid to illustrate how a defoamer disperses across the surface of the foaming media. Kevin is kind of our in-house graphic specialist, so he's done a great job in demonstrating some of this. <clears throat> And then when we talk about defoamer function, again, a great um, picture of how this happens. The defoamers basically contra contain microscopic particles that penetrate the foam wall. You hear us talk about two types of defoamers. We'll talk about the, the term soluble or uh, dispersible or emulsifiable. We'll refer to the defoamers that will disperse or be soluble in the solution or in the water. And over time, these will eventually rise to the top of the, uh, of the media and, uh, and uh, function as uh, either a defoam or an antifoam. Also, you see a picture on the right, a clear example of what's called an insoluble defoamer. So you can well imagine on the right, if you were to shake that up, how quickly that product would come to the top. It's not really 100%, but typically a product like a dispersible or soluble or emulsifiable will work over a wide ranging of the system, going under weirs and passing through equipment and giving you full coverage throughout an entire system. Whereas an insoluble one, typically it can get um, you know, tied up behind weirs or in tanks, but also can be very, very effective very quickly to knock foam down in a very specific location. Some of the types of defoamers that we see in the water treatment market are silicone-based defoamers, oil-based defoamers, synthetic defoamers, you also hear them called oil-free or ester-based defoamers, and then the water or water-extended defoamers. And these are typically the ones that we see in the, in the uh, wastewater and uh, uh, cooling water applications that we see in our industry. Now we're going to take a look at some of the factors that affect foam. Um, they are chemistry, solids, pH, temperature, and system parameters, and we're just going to take a look at each of them individually. So the first um, one that we're going to talk about is chemistry. So chemistry in this instance refers to both the chemistry of the actual foaming media and then as well the chemistry of the product itself. When we talk about product chemistry, it's important to consider if there are product restrictions. An example of this is that a silicone defoamer will create problems in a plating application, so you would want to avoid that in that instance. Talking about solids, solids can um, impact the performance of the defoamer itself. Is there inconsistency or variation in the level of solids that need to be addressed. As we talked about earlier, impinged air or solids on microfoam can actually prevent the foam from breaking up. <clears throat> and then also dissolved solids and total solids can impact the performance of the product and also how much foam you actually are dealing with. When we talk about pH, extremes of pH may also affect the system foam um, and also the product performance itself. So extremes of the pH can just basically make the product itself much less effective. Um, this slide is actually one that Kevin and I had a good chuckle about. So um, when we're talking about temperature, you need to consider basically how the temperature will impact the foam and then how the temperature will impact the performance of the actual product. So temperature can create can cause the creation of more foam and then it can also negatively affect the performance of the product. <laughs> so at temperatures greater than 60 degrees Celsius, water-based defoamers can become less effective. And then at temperatures of less than 7.2 degrees Celsius, um, it can actually inhibit the dispersion of the product. I insisted that Kevin put the Canadian <laughs> <laughs> temperatures in there. <clears throat> and then when we move to system parameters, it's, it's important that as you consider foam, you look at system obstacles. So are there weirs or other obstacles that the, the product is going to have to pass either over or under? 
Um, is there agitation and how much agitation? Where does it occur? And then cascading. So water falling will create turbulence, which then will create foam. And then lastly, uh, thinking about retention time. How long is the water actually in the system? Is the water in a small holding tank for a limited period of time? Or are we addressing foam in a lagoon where the water remains captive for a long period of time? So when we look at these defoamers, we start to look at some of the components that are used to put together products. And you have things like silicones or silica, the mids, mineral oils, and the phosphates. So a variety of different chemistries are blended together to actually create your uh, defoamer. Now, this needs to be taken into consideration when you're looking at applications. What we mean by that is really what are the component restrictions? What can't we use in the system? And some of the examples of product and, and, and components you can't use would be things like silicones in a metal finishing or a metal plating area. Um, you can see this car in the top right-hand side. I'm not saying this was caused by an in, incorrect defoamer, but you put a defoamer in a system that can affect the surface of the metal, you know, causing problems with painting or plating. You know, in the auto industry, in the paint spray booth, or even in the steel industry, you really, they really shy away from you even bringing in silicone defoamers for fear of them getting into a wrong application and causing problems with the, uh, with the, uh, the metal or uh, uh, the ability for uh, plating or painting to occur. We've already talked about this, but you can well imagine that a sewage treatment plant or a waste discharge into a stream or lake, if you're using an oil-based defoamer to knock down the foam, well, that's all in well and good. You might have uh, uh, no foam in the stream, but you also could have now an oil sheen that these products can create. So you need to take that in consideration. And then lastly, another example is uh, with reverse osmosis. Uh, many to most of these pro products will have small microscopic particles in them, which can actually blind the, uh, the membrane. I actually did some work in the production of membranes where they were using a uh, silicone defoamer, and the silicone was actually getting on the particles. The silicone was actually getting on the membrane during manufacturing, and we switched them to a water base, and they were actually able to recover about 20% more of the membrane. So you've got to consider things like that, particles, getting into a system in a case of a reverse osmosis. So, you know, let's talk a little bit about testing and, and what kind of tests do we run to find out how these products function or could function. And there are three basic tests that we have in our industry. We have the shake test, the airstone test, and the foam cell. Well, the first one, the shake test, very, very simple, very rudimentary, nothing more than clear bottles, either plastic or glass. Obviously, samples of the products, the defoamers are anti-foams, um, and then the water or the material that needs to be uh, foamed, uh, the, where the foam needs to be controlled. And what you do in the case of a defoamer, you would put your water in there and shake the bottle and create foam, and then take a little bit of your defoamer and put it in there and see if it knocks it down. If you want to test it as an anti-foam, you'd put the, put the defoamer in first, then fill with water and shake it and see if foam occurs. So, it's a good test to have in, on, on hand if you're having a problem or you suspect a quick problem and you want a quick recommendation or a quick fix. The airstone test is really the one that I like the best. Um, I've used this extensively. Um, basically what it is, if, if you look at the photo, you'll see an airstone, uh, airstones from the aquariums, um, an, an air pump from an aquarium air pump, and tubing, and a graduated cylinder, preferably clear. And so what you do is you fill your media, put your water in and put your airstone in and you turn the pump on and that air starts to, airstone starts to produce a foam. And now you can add your defoamer and because of the graduated cylinder, you can measure how quickly that or thoroughly that foam will be knocked down with your product. The test is an anti-foam. You do the, basically the same thing. You put the water in, you put the, the uh, anti-foam in, and then turn the air on and see if foam occurs. A little joke we always like to say is when you're testing in the field, always test your products last and your competitors first, because no matter how thoroughly you clean this uh, equipment, especially the air stones, you keep building up a small and small and small amount. So I've, I've seen over the days where I've 
tested for days on end or a full day of testing, I notice that my results get better at the end of the day than they do at the beginning of the day. So with this test here, I like to buy many, many, many air stones and just keep replacing them rather than trying to clean them. Then the last test that we want to talk about is what's called a foam cell test. Very similar to graduated cylinder test, you have a tube that's designed to really create and enhance foam. Again, it's graduated, much like a graduated cylinder. And you have a small recirculating pump where it pumps the water through, and basically that's a nozzle on the top that actually shoots the water down into the tube. And it gives you a little more control, unlike the air stone where you're kind of limited by the amount of air you put in. This you can control the flow. You can also put an aspirator on to put a little more air in or less air as needed. It gives you more control and you know better better way of uh, of testing for foam. But again, this this unit here can either be a field unit or can be a um, uh, a lab unit. For the most part, I've really seen these more as the lab units uh, where you can bring material to the lab and test your products for uh, their functionality. So when you're running your tests, you always need to consider some of the parameters you're looking at. You know, what is needed? Do we need full foam reduction? Do we need to eliminate it totally? Do we need a temporary foam reduction? Um, I remember one plant that I was, uh, was working in, they had a small little tank, and all they needed to do was prevent foam from coming out of that tank. They could have cared less if there was foam prior or after, so they just really needed some product that would temporarily reduce the foam in that small tank. You know, Katie had mentioned earlier the degree of foam reduction. Do you need to knock it the whole way down, or do you simply need to keep it down so it doesn't overflow a tank? Um, time, you know, how much time do you have? Uh, how fast will that product be knocked down? Does it need to be knocked down right now, or does it need to be knocked down uh, over an hour or two hours? It's really not that much of a problem. And the key is to persistency. How long, you know, do I leave my test unit on for 20 minutes and come back and look at the air stove? after 20 minutes or after a half hour or after two minutes. So run that test accordingly. And then I don't think we can stress enough the component restrictions, really talking with the customer and finding out what components can they not tolerate and understand that and then design your program accordingly. Some of the things to consider also when you're testing is, um, does, your, does your test reflect the system? Are you seeing a lot of turbulence in the system? Are there weirs in the system? How much time do they have? Another thing you need to take into consideration, and you maybe all understand this, but you know, what time of the day, what day of the week? Um, you know, we all a lot of see our customers do a lot of cleaning over the weekends. A lot of surfactants and cleaners are used. So you show up Monday morning and you have foam everywhere. So is there a different foaming on Monday compared to Thursday? Um, is the defoam soluble or insoluble? Again, back to am I trying to defoam an entire system? Am I trying to defoam an entire plant? Or do I have an isolated area that I need to, uh, need to uh, focus in on? And again, the last one, again, back to components. Is the defoamer compatible with the system? So in the field, it's important to remember that Usually defoamers are fed meat, so that this is an area where they don't need to be diluted like a polymer. Um, water can be used as a carrier. If you think about a spray system, the water is basically just being used to distribute the, the defoamer to different areas. Um, the next point is, is pretty key to this whole discussion is that you want to make sure that you're feeding the defoamer as close to the actual problem area as possible. And then lastly, uh, we've talked about this you know, a couple times throughout the presentation, but just considering system characteristics. So are you having to overcome weirs or spray bars? And then sometimes it makes sense to add a second feed location just to get the, the most bang for your buck. Now this is just kind of a, a rule of thumb. It's not 100% accurate, but it just kind of paints a mental picture here. Typically, soluble defoamers are um, better at passing under objects. Because they don't come to the surface as quickly, they'll tend to be dispersed throughout the medium. They will eventually come to the top, but if you are talking about a system with a lot of obstacles, as you feed a, an anti, a, a soluble defoamer, 
it'll take a while for it to come to the top, maybe give you a little fuller coverage, maybe not as effective, but a fuller coverage over a system. Whereas when you're talking insoluble defoamers, and if you go back to that picture we put up earlier, the defoamer on the top or the product on the top of the water, you know, that'll give you a very, very quick, right to the surface, very, very quick, and really can function as knocking foam down very, very quickly in a, in a specific or isolated area. So although not 100% accurate with, with, with what we're saying, but, you know, the soluble defoamers tend to work as an anti-foam and can be fed to prevent foam throughout a whole system, whereas the insoluble ones typically are used more as defoamers on an isolated incident and knocking those down as quickly as possible. So as we come to the close of the presentation, just taking a minute to review uh, where defoamer or anti-foamer is commonly found, what applications are they used in. So when you talk about cooling towers, does the customer or client have a process leak? Um, often the active products in the cooling tower can create foam. We've talked a little bit about municipal or biological foam, uh, wastewater applications, refining, and then the last one that I want to comment on is a general industry. So at no point in the presentation up to this point did we address food grade defoamer. So I used to visit a customer who was operating a potato cutting and washing facility and they would dose defoamer in their wastewater system. So some people might argue that because the product's not actually coming into contact with the food itself that it doesn't need to be a food grade product. However, the customer in you know, insisted and wanted it to be a food grade um, product. So that's just, again, we've talked multiple times about making sure that you understand the, the you know, the needs or the restrictions of the product. And so it's, it is important to remember that when dealing with a food plant, that's something that's going to come up. Very good. Yeah, and kind of the same thing I spoke about earlier, although the defoamers in the, uh, in the metals plant that I worked at never really came anywhere near the uh, cold rolling area the customer was just afraid of having silicone defoamers on site. So we, uh, we, we did not bring silicone defoamers in for emergency situations, always had water base. Um, so that really kind of concludes our presentation. And um, at this time, I'm, I'm sure there may be some questions. If I guess, Heidi, uh, uh, the people should type them in and we'll do our best to answer them. Is that the, uh, is the, is the protocol here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one other note I'll make is that a copy of this presentation will be sent out to everyone after the session today, and we will also have a recorded version of this on the website uh, by the end of the day or tomorrow. And we do have one question. Uh, everyone else can go ahead and type their questions in as they come. But one question we have right now is, can you please talk about using soft water as makeup to cooling towers and how to eliminate foaming? Well, that's a good question. When it comes to cooling towers, what the products I tend to like to work if there is foam would be the water-based. Um, those are what I typically recommend when we see foaming in cooling towers in the case of soft water. Um, they, they really do the best job for that type of application. The components in those typically will not affect what you're trying to do from a corrosion standpoint. So for soft water in a cooling system, um, the best products there would be some sort of a water-based or water-extended defoamer really could help you to control that. Also, if you're using, say, like a quad biocide along the lines um, where, you know, you do get foaming. Again, for cooling systems, uh, silicones are something to consider, but I think from a technical standpoint, I, 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 I personally like the uh, water base, and, and hopefully that answers the question, but for foaming and cooling systems, I think the water base do a nice job. Great, thanks, Kevin. We have another question. Um, Non-ionic polymers and quat biocides can cause foam in cooling towers if o overfed. Are there any anti-foams that could be compatible with these materials or typical um, cooling water blends? Now, wait a minute. Did somebody read my, my first answer and then write <laughs> um, You know, I made the comment about being with quat. Again, I, I personally think for, for cooling systems, when you do start seeing, you know, bi foaming from a quat, the water-based biocides really are the way to go. If I may, just just give you a, a quick discussion. Um, back when when I get a technical question and and somebody is in an emergency and they have a foaming problem and they need something to be 
brought in tomorrow to knock the phone down yesterday, we'll typically recommend a 10% silicone. For the most part, we know those are going to work. However, once they're in and they're working, you really need to step back and test and find out is the right is that the right chemistry for the application. You know, not saying that silicones can't work, but in the case of cooling systems, especially with something like we discussed with the soft water or with the quant, the silicone is an option, but the water base may be a technically better and a technically less expensive mechanism for knocking foam down in the cooling systems. Um, if you look at the pricing of silicones, it's based on the silicone oil, and is, that, that typically is, is I'm, I'm making it sound like a roller coaster as I'm explaining this, the price can go up and down greatly, whereas water-based tend to be, you know, more on, the, on a steady, steady pricing. So to answer the question about the quant, um, I would, I would very seriously consider with any cooling system, but in the case of the quant or with soft water, looking at water-based defumbers. Thanks, Kevin. We have okay. a few more questions. Um, right. Are silicone or water extended defoamers water dilutable or should they be fed neat as a neat product? The answer to that question is always they always should be fed neat. Okay. However, there are times when they make sense not to dilute but to, well, I guess to dilute if your pump is of, a, of an incorrect size or if you're trying to pump them a very, very, very long distance. So. Technically, they should not be diluted down, but you really don't, you lose a little bit, but from a function, from a, from a, uh, uh, a treatment standpoint or an equipment standpoint, I can understand why you would want to dilute them down. Um, again, so your pump is the, the correct size or you have an extended area you need to spread the defomer out over. But the answer, if, you know, should be, they should always be fed neat, but they can be diluted down for ease of feed. Great, thank you. Can you please discuss foam control when caused by biofouling, such as biofilms? Do foam over treat the symptom, but any insight on controlling the cause? Well, I mean, when you, I guess, read, read the question one more time, Heidi. Was they, were they talking about problems in a, in a, like a biological treatment plant, or were they talking about problems caused by biofilm in a cooling system? A little unclear on that. Um, I, th I doesn't say, but I think they're probably meaning bi biofilm in a cooling system. Uh, well, I mean, there you're looking at the, obviously the control better from a bi from a biological treatment standpoint. The you know the correct use of biocides or a biopenetrant. Um, I, I, you know, I'm back to I, again. You're, I don't want to keep saying water based, but for cooling systems, that's probably the best way to go. Um, if they're talking about a municipal plant where you're seeing biological problems there, you're probably having problems with sludge age. More than likely, the sludge is too old. Um, in that case, you start to need to start wasting more to get the sludge age down. Um, when, when you're talking about municipal um, uh, uh, biological foam, the ester-based or the uh, synthetic-based tend to be the best products for those. Um, they're a little more, on the, quite a bit on the more expensive side, but for biological foam control in a biological system, typically the ester based are what are recommended there. Okay. Great. And do you have a recommended anti foam to use in glycol systems that are experiencing foaming? <laughs> Great question. We were joking around about this this morning. I can't really make a recommendation there. I, I have no experience in glycol. Kate and I were actually talking. If you get that person's name, I can look into that and give you a give you a recommendation there. But that's the one area I have I have I've never had a glycol system that I personally have treated. So if you want to take that person's name down, be more than happy to get back with them with that answer. Just that's sure. one area I don't have a lot of experience. Great. Um, another question: Is there a mechanical way of dealing with cooling tower foaming? Yeah, one of the things that you can do is, you know, like, and I've actually seen this, where you have spray systems. You build a spray system, you know, you have the water that's actually spraying down, knocking foam down. I've also seen the balls being used in sumps. If there are problems there, those floating balls to prevent foam there. But the most part, most people use, like, the spray systems um, to physically knock foam down. Great. Okay. 
Great. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Kevin and Katie, for um, the webinar today. We will make sure everyone that's sending questions will send these to um, both Kevin and Katie. If they can expand on them, um, they will. But thank you so much, everyone. Thank you all. We appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye.